Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez with the Fatima Center, and we're here for one of our Ask Father sessions with Father Isaac Mary Raillier on location in Rome. So Father Isaac, we have several questions that have come in from our supporters. The first one being, to advance in the spiritual life, do I need a spiritual director? If so, how do I find a good one? What qualities does a good spiritual director have? So, a very, very good question. And it says in the scripture, only a fool guides himself. Uh, the problem today is how to find a good spiritual director because as we know, the, the priesthood is in shambles. Uh, they've been teaching seminarians heresy for 60 years now, longer, but the last 60 years is a total, total, this devastated vineyard, you say, it's, 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 it's pitiful. So to find a good spiritual director, you got to really pray to Our Lady. And sometimes we're better off without a, you're better off without a spiritual director than have a bad one. Because a bad spiritual director will do more damage to your soul than without one. Because he's going to, it's, it's a very intimate relationship in the sense where that spiritual director is dealing with your soul and the depths of your soul. And, and can have eternal consequences. Now, to have a good director is one of the greatest gifts that God can give you. There's no doubt about it. It's interesting, St. Teresa of Avila said, when it comes to a director, if you have to choose between a holy one and a learning one, she said, take the learning one. That's very interesting. But you want, some of the qualities you want in a spiritual director is, number one, a priest uh, is at least striving for holiness. Number two, a priest that has the knowledge, because, once again, it's important. Uh, another thing is the priest should have zeal for souls. Uh, he's not there to be your friend. He's not there to hang out and have coffee and go out with you and all. He's not there for you to call up and be crying about every little thing that's going on. He's there to make sure that the spirit is, that's guiding you is the Holy Ghost and not the evil one. Do you need to by any chance look to see if the priest has got a Marian devotion? Well, these are, once again, qualifications. This priest should be totally dedicated to the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, he should take the Mass. The most serious uh, thing you could do is celebrate the holy sacrifice. That's the priest's number one obligation, to offer sacrifice. And if he's up there celebrating Mass and it looks like a circus, you don't want to go to a man like that. Uh, so, Eucharist, number two, he should be totally devoted to Our Lady. Uh, St. Joseph of Faso said, a, a priest who's not devoted to Our Lady expect no good from him, nothing. But a priest who's devoted to Our Lady expect great, great things. Hopefully that gives us some steps that will guide us in finding a director, but prayer, definitely. Another question on prayer now. Does it mean anything when, during prayer, I smell roses, even when there are no roses around? One thing we have to watch, everyone, unfortunately, because we have human nature, we're always looking for consolations. But the thing of smelling roses, we know that it's been associated with some great saints, like if Padre Pio, if you're praying for his intercession, sometimes it's sent a rose. I have a friend of mine, his name is John Delaney, and he, when he was in the Navy, he was coming uh, through a doorway, and there was a pipe, and he said he grabbed it, he wanted to swing, and when he did, he was getting electrocuted in the air. And there was other Navy men, sailors, that witnessed this. And they said they heard, he didn't even know it. They said he yelled out, Padre Pio, help. And at that moment, he was thrown off the electric pipe and the whole room, the whole sh ship in that room filled up with roses. Now, you know that was authentic because he would have died. He was saved. Nothing happened to him and they, they were blown away by the scent of roses. So it can be from God, it can be, but the devil could also uh, give you a scent of roses, and you know, maybe you're doing something bad and you smell roses and you think you're doing something good. You know, you gotta be very careful with these. Like some people like to do these novenas. If I get a red rose, it means this, and a white rose, it means the opposite. Be very careful with that stuff. All right, thank you. Again, some properties. Go back, this is where it does help, if you do have a good spiritual director, to go and submit to him all things, all things. And once again, don't seek consolation. Uh, the St. Teresa of Avila says, when God gives you consolation, thank him. When he takes it away, thanks him. When you're in desolation, you thank him. Sounds good. So take that to your spiritual director. Take it to the priest. And 
Going now back to our Blessed Mother, the question is, did the Blessed Virgin Mary suffer pain when she gave birth to our Lord? And if not, why not? That question makes me cringe and gets me angry because I love my mother. The Blessed Virgin Mary is free from all sin. We know that one of the consequences of Eve and Adam's original sin was that they were kicked out of the garden, all right? They lost their state of sanctifying grace, that Adam would have to work by the, uh, the sweat of his brow. But he said to Eve, God, in the Eve, because you led your husband into sin, you receive all his punishment, but a twofold more. You must be submissive to man, which women really don't like. And number two, you will have pain in childbearing. And so they came out with a movie, uh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 10 or 8 years ago. I don't know, it was Mary and Nazareth. I don't want to get the wrong title. Like so the don't, Nativity Story. The Nativity, one of those, so don't quote me exactly. I don't want to get the wrong. And they showed you Our Lady having pains giving birth. That is total blasphemy and is heresy. And it's, it's a crime. It's just, that's the devil mocking Our Lady. The fathers of the church, when you study the great saints, they tell you how the birth happened. It was a total miracle because it was a virgin conceives without a man. And she, they, they say like this, it's like uh, sunlight going through a pane of glass. It goes through without penetrating, it doesn't break it. And so one minute our lady standing there, the next minute our Lord is in her arms. Well, and you know, another beautiful tradition, I think I just saw it in St. Mary Major. It's a beautiful painting on the wall because that church is completely dedicated to Our Lady, all these pictures of her life, and it shows a nativity, and Our Lady is there, Our Lord has just been born, and it's St. Michael on one side and St. Gabriel on the other side, and they've basically received Our Lord into you know, like a swaddling cloth. And I know there's an ancient tradition also, and that ties in with this idea that it was a miraculous total, birth. Total. Uh, it's, 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 you know... It's very important because, you know, once again, the sign from Isaiah, how do you know the Messiah? The virgin shall be with child. And she is a virgin before, joint, and after. And anyone that says different is Harry. And let me tell you this. I'm going to warn anyone who blasphemes Our Lady, you're begging God to pour his wrath upon you because he doesn't like anyone messing with his mother. On that note, Father, please give us your blessing. Pax et benedictio Dei Onipotente, Pace, Filio Spiritus Sancti, and Descendus Super Vos Menei Sancti Amen. Join us for our next Acts Father session. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us.